Let's turn to Galatians chapter 2. That's uh, where we're working our way through at the present time. Uh, Galatians 2. We come to the very last two verses of this chapter this morning, 2021. That will be our text. But we'll begin reading uh, here in Galatians 2 at verse 11 and read through uh, to verse 21. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also have found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor, for I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And the Lord bless to us again his reading, uh, the reading of his word, and uh, now also as we come to take up those last two verses of Galatians uh, 2 in the sermon. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. For Christ liveth in me, in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Prior to his conversion, Paul had lived in the closest possible relationship to the law. He found in the law a friend and indeed he found that the law, at least to his perception, was the source of his salvation. As a Pharisee, he had rigorously kept the law, convinced that by keeping the law it afforded him a place before God. In other words, Paul, prior to his conversion, believed that his obedience to the law could actually save him. And for that reason, he had studiously cultivated a relationship with the law. Paul confirms that in Philippians 3, in the verses 4 through 6, where he reviews his life prior to his conversion. And there he says, If any other man thinketh that he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more, he says, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. However, all that changed uh, that day uh, when the risen Christ arrested Paul on the Damascus Road. From that day on, Paul's view of and relationship to the Lord changed dramatically. Whereas prior to his conversion, 
Paul lived to the law, seeking his approval with God out of the law, out of his obedience to the law. Following his conversion, though, Paul died to the law. And he reflects that in verse 19 that we looked at last Lord's Day. For I, through the law, he says, am dead to the law. Paul died to the law in the sense that he came to realise that his purported obedience to the law could in fact not save him. What became etched into Paul's heart and mind following his conversion was the unassailable truth that by the works of the law shall no flesh, shall no man uh, be justified. Through the unattainable demands of the law itself, Paul was actually brought to the realisation that he was a sinner and that it was utterly impossible for him to be justified in God's sight, that is, to be declared righteous in God's sight on the basis of his obedience to the law. Being convinced of those things, Paul died to the law in that the relationship that once existed between Paul and the law was in fact put to death, put away. Rather than seeking now his justification on the basis of his obedience to the law, Paul sought to be justified in God's sight on the basis and on the ground of the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. Having died to the law as the ground for his justification, Paul was empowered to live unto God. That's what he uh, ends verse 19 with. He says, For I through the law am dead to the law, in order that or that I might live unto God. In our text this morning, Paul expands on how it was that he was empowered to live unto God. The explanation that Paul gives us is that he, in fact, had been crucified with Christ. When Jesus Christ was crucified, uh, Paul, the old Paul, Paul the Pharisee, Paul the man that sought his justification uh, through the, his obedience to the law, that Paul had been crucified with Christ. And having been crucified with Christ, Paul had been empowered to live unto God. How so? The answer was, he was empowered to live unto God because Jesus Christ lived within him. You see, by faith, Paul was united to Jesus Christ. And the same is true for every believer. Brethren, by faith, you and I are united to Jesus Christ. And by virtue of that indwelling of the living God, the indwelling of Jesus Christ, we too are empowered to live unto God. In our text this morning, Paul opens up for us the profound subject of the believer's mystical union with Jesus Christ. We're going to look at this uh, word of God then under this theme, crucified with Christ. We'll look at these uh, three headings, the intimate union, Secondly, the radical transformation. And finally, the irresistible conclusion. I am crucified with Christ, says Paul. Now, if you think about that, that's quite an amazing statement. I am crucified with Christ. Well, literally, Paul says there, uh, with Christ, I have been crucified. As we... Uh, uh, seek to unpack what Paul means by that. Note firstly that Paul speaks here of himself personally. 
Clearly, Paul, in what he was saying, was not merely expounding an objective truth. It was an objective truth, but it's not just simply an objective truth to him. It was an intensely personal truth so far as he was concerned. Notice here that he does not actually speak even as he's done previously in chapter 2. He doesn't speak in terms of we and us, but rather he repeatedly speaks in the first person, I, me. Notice that on eight occasions in this uh, verse, that is verse 20, he speaks in the first person. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, though Paul clearly speaks uh, in the first person, and that this is an intensely personal issue to the apostle, it should also be noted that Paul was not actually speaking exclusively of himself. Indeed, despite all of the personal references, uh, Paul was not seeking to draw attention to himself or to what he, in fact, had done. To the contrary, verse 20 is not all about Paul, but in fact, verse 20 is actually all about Jesus Christ and the changes that Jesus Christ had wrought in Paul's life. It's evident from what Paul says here that Christianity for him was not an institutionalised religion. It was not a religion of outward uh, externalities. It was not a religion of empty motions and lifeless rituals. Rather, for Paul, Christianity involved a living, vital, personal, indeed intimate relationship between himself and the risen Christ. Christianity for Paul was to know Christ. It was to trust Christ. It was to love Christ. It was to be in Christ. It was to live out of Jesus Christ. There was nothing superficial, mechanical or clinical about the Christian life so far as Paul was concerned. For Paul, Christianity was a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, an an encounter that changed everything about his life. It changed for Paul who he was, what he thought, how he lived, what motivated him, what he prioritised, what he did and why he did it. Indeed, clearly from this passage it's uh, evident that Uh, Christianity uh, had an impact upon every area and every aspect of Paul's life. And that stems from the fact that he was crucified with Christ. What does Paul mean, though, there when he says that I am crucified with Christ? It's interesting that the King James uses the verb to be I am crucified with Christ. In the original Greek, the verb is a slightly different form. Uh, Literally, the uh, translation is I have been crucified with Christ. And the idea is that uh, Paul is pointing back to something in the past, but which has an abiding relevance even for the present. And that was true of this uh, statement that he had been crucified with Christ. Notice here that Paul actually speaks of a dual crucifixion. He speaks of Jesus Christ's crucifixion, that is, of Jesus Christ's death on the cross, but he speaks here also about his own crucifixion. I am crucified with Christ. And what's evident is that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and Paul's own crucifixion uh, 
uh, were intimately linked. When Jesus Christ was crucified, so was I, says Paul. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, so did I, says Paul. Now, Paul, of course, is not speaking literally. He's not suggesting that he was physically present at Calvary when some 20 years earlier Jesus Christ had been crucified, nor is Paul suggesting that he was physically nailed to a cross uh, at the same time as was Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul's not asserting that he was like the two thieves that were nailed to the cross, nailed to crosses on either side of Jesus Christ. But Paul actually here is speaking about something that was even far more profound. When Paul declares, I am crucified with Christ, he links himself to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and what flowed from the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says here, when Christ was crucified, I was crucified. Not only was I there, but I actually was crucified with and in him. When they nailed him to the cross, they nailed me to the cross. It was as though they had driven the nails through my hands and my feet as well. I was there just as really as though I had experienced in those six hours of his crucifixion the same agony and the same pain as he did. It was as though in my body I bore the brunt of the wrath of God against sin. I was there just as really as though I had cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I was there as really as though I cried with a loud voice, It is finished. For he says that when Jesus Christ died, he died. And he was there with him also in what followed when they laid him in the sepulchre of Joseph of Arimathea. He was there when the grave, grave clothes were wrapped around his body. Uh, Paul here is indicating that they were also wrapped around him. When they buried him, they buried Paul. And three days later, uh, Jesus Christ rose triumphantly from the dead, conquering death. Paul says, I also rose from the dead. When, I, when he was resurrected, I was resurrected. When he ascended to the right hand of his father, I also, says Paul, was raised up and seated with Christ in heavenly places. What Paul says here concerning himself is true of every believer. Brethren, by God's grace, this is true of you and me. All who look to Jesus Christ for their salvation, were crucified with Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. If you're an adopted son or daughter of God, you were crucified with Jesus Christ at Calvary. But still we haven't really explained what Paul meant when he declares, I am or have been crucified with Christ. As I've indicated, clearly Paul does not mean that he in any physical sense was nailed to the cross or that he was in any sense physically uh, crucified. He was not physically crucified at Calvary. Nor did he suffer in his own body any of the agonies and the torments of the cross. His words are not to be interpreted literally. And we were not to see here either that in some out-of-body experience, uh, Paul very closely identifies himself with the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Nor was it that Paul identified himself with Jesus Christ in some emotional way, whereby as he contemplated the cross, he became emotionally distraught, empathising with the agony and the suffering of Jesus. That's not what not, is not what is being pointed to here. 
Paul was crucified with Christ in, when the, in that when Jesus Christ died upon the cross, Paul was in him. If you ever, ever look through the New Testament scriptures, that is one of the most common phrases that describes the believer's relationship to Jesus Christ. Believers are in him, in him. That is, they are to be identified with him. In him in the sense that the believer is spiritually united to Jesus Christ. Paul, along with every other believer, was upon the heart and mind of Jesus Christ when Christ was nailed to that cross at Calvary. If you and I are in Christ, we too are upon the heart and the mind of Jesus Christ at Calvary. Just as when Adam sinned, so Paul sinned in him. And when Adam fell, Paul fell with him. When Adam died, Paul died. We are all in Adam in that sense. So likewise, when Jesus Christ, the second Adam, was crucified, every believer was also in him. Jesus Christ, you see, is our head and representative. And Jesus Christ was crucified in Paul's place and in his stead. And so Paul was crucified with him and in him. And the same is true for every believer. Therefore, when Jesus Christ died, because we were spiritually united to him, we also died. When he rose from the dead, we rose with him. When he was exalted, we were also exalted with him. As we read in John chapter 10 and verse 11, Jesus Christ laid down his life for the sheep. In the words of Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. At the cross, Jesus Christ took the place of Paul and he suffered in his name and on his account. There at the cross, Jesus Christ became accursed for Paul. In Galatians 3.13, Paul writes, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. The law demanded perfect obedience. And because Paul had not obeyed the law perfectly, he stood under the curse and condemnation of the law. The same is true for each and every one of us. We haven't kept the law of God perfectly. We stand consequently under the curse and the condemnation of the law. And as Ezekiel declares in Ezekiel 18 and 20, the soul that sinneth it shall die. Paul was legally under the condemnation of death just as uh, truly as you and I are also by virtue of our sins uh, legally under the condemnation of death. However, when Jesus Christ was crucified, he redeemed Paul from the curse of the law. The totality of Paul's sins were laid on Jesus Christ there on the cross of Calvary. At the cross, all of the wrath of God that should have been poured out upon Paul was actually poured out upon Jesus Christ. He became a curse for Paul. He became a curse for you and for me. In the death of Jesus Christ, it was as though Paul himself was crucified. It was as though you and I were crucified and that the punishment that was due to Paul and that the punishment that was due 
to you and me, it was paid in full, in and through the suffering and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It was as though we were actually crucified with Christ. It was as though we bore the wrath of God in Christ for all our sins. In his crucifixion, Jesus Christ fulfilled all the demands of the law and he fulfilled all the requirements of the law perfectly so that Paul and all those who are in Christ have in the sight of God fulfilled every demand of the law. The law can no longer be a source of condemnation for those for whom Christ died because Paul was crucified with Christ and because by God's grace uh, brethren, you and I too have been crucified with Christ. Our sins are forgiven. Our sins are put away. Christ's righteousness is our righteousness. And we are righteous in the sight of God. That's not uh, future. That's present. We are righteous in the sight of God. That's a present reality. Because as believers we have been crucified with Christ, as Paul declares in Romans 8, chapter, Romans 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And furthermore, as Paul asks and declares in Romans 8, 33 and 34, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. How was it that Paul came to be crucified with Christ? How is it that you and I were also crucified with Christ? Behind the wonder of the cross stands the electing love of God. You and I were with Christ at the cross. You and I were crucified with Christ, not because we identified with him, but because he loved us and gave himself for us. When Christ was crucified, he knew for whom he died and he took their sins upon himself. What an extraordinary truth, brethren. We were actually loved by Jesus Christ at the cross and he willingly laid down his life at the cross for our sakes. Now to be crucified implies that a person dies And being crucified with Christ, that was exactly what Paul had experienced and that is also what every believer actually experiences. Paul was crucified with Christ. When Christ died, he died. But note what Paul goes on to say in verse 20. Nevertheless, I live. When Christ died, Paul died. Nevertheless, he says, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Something within Paul died when Christ was crucified. Something within you and me also died with Christ. At the cross, Jesus Christ not only bore the condemnation that was due to us for our sins, but he also died in order to deliver us from the bondage and the power of sin. At the cross, Jesus Christ overcame the right of sin to reign over us and the power of sin to rule over us. 
We read that this morning in Romans 6 and verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that is, with Jesus Christ, that, or in order that, the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Christ's death for us was not only in terms of payment, it was not only in terms of the bearing of God's wrath, not only in terms of the removing of our condemnation, not only in terms of fulfilling all of the demands of the law on our behalf, it was not only in terms of securing the forgiveness of our sins, but the death of Jesus Christ also concerned our deliverance and our freedom. The me... The me who was enslaved to sin, says Paul, lives no more. The me who lived according to the lusts of the flesh lives no more. The me who lived out of a desire to serve sin was crucified at the cross. The old me, the old me that loved the wages of unrighteousness was put to death at the cross so that now I live, but it's not really me. It is Christ who lives within me as a result of his being crucified with Christ. The old Paul had died, the Paul that had looked to self for his righteousness before God, that Paul had been crucified. Paul lived, but the old Paul, the Paul that was wedded to sin and to the service of Satan, no longer lived within him. There was now a new royal resident within Paul, and that new royal resident was Jesus Christ. As a result, Paul no longer pursued a life devoted to self and to the service of sin. Jesus Christ was now the one that directed and guided his life. Paul lived out of a new principle of life. Having been crucified with Christ, Christ now lived within him. Paul was a new creature. Yes, he still battled every day with his remaining corruption and with the old man of sin. But in essence, he was a new creature in that Jesus Christ ruled and reigned in his life. Brethren, that describes every believer. That describes you and me by God's grace. Brethren, Paul speaks here of that mystical union, that living, vital, spiritual relationship that exists between the believer and Jesus Christ, whereby Jesus Christ is our life, strength and blessedness. The term mystical is used in describing that relationship in the sense that it concerns a union or the union between a believer and Jesus Christ the nature of which far transcends all earthly relationships in its intimacy and transforming power. And as such, it surpasses our comprehension. Though it surpasses our comprehension, we should understand this, it's real. It's real. As believers, we are intimately and really united to Jesus Christ by a spiritual bond. Martin Luther, speaking of the union between the believer and Jesus Christ, said this, By faith you are so cemented to Christ that he and you are as one person, which cannot be separated, but remains attached to him forever. Paul describes that spiritual bond in this way in our text when he says 
The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The life which I now live in the flesh, he says, and by those words Paul is actually referencing his present life, the life that he lived day by day. And Paul says that he lived that life, he lived day by day by the faith of the Son of God who loved him and who gave himself for him. In other words, he says, I go about life by means of the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And it should be understood here that faith, as employed here, does not refer so much to the activity of believing and trusting. But faith here refers to a spiritual union or bond. Paul says here, I live by virtue of the spiritual bond, the spiritual union that exists between me and the Son of God. The Son of God who actually loved me and gave himself for me. I live by means of that spiritual union with the Son of God. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Son of God who loved me. Very personal, isn't it? The Son of God who loved me before the foundation of the world. A love that was supremely demonstrated at the cross. The Son of God loved Paul. Just, just let that thought sink down into your minds, brethren. The Son of God. The Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, loved Paul. And then apply that to yourself. The Son of God loved me. The Son of God who came into this world sinners to save. The Son of God who endured all of the humiliation of this life. The Son of God who laid down his life upon the cross of Calvary. Paul says, I live. I live because of my union with the Son of God. That spiritual bond between the believer and Jesus Christ is established by the indwelling of the Spirit of Christ in the heart of every believer. Christ lives in the heart of his people. Christ lived in the heart of Paul. Christ lives in the heart of every child of God. But then Jesus Christ lives in you and me by his Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the Spirit of Christ lives in us and through that Spirit we are united to Jesus Christ himself and through the Spirit of Christ we receive the gift of a new principle of life. We are new creatures in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Paul says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. In Romans 12 and verse 2, Paul speaks of the spiritual metamorphosis that takes place in the heart of every believer. In that, in the indwelling of Christ, they are transformed by the renewing of their mind. There's a spiritual metamorphosis that takes place in the mind of every believer when they come into a living relationship with Jesus Christ. It's interesting that our Westminster Confession of Faith in the chapter on sanctification describes the spiritual transformation in these terms. Uh, the Westminster Divine said, and I quote, they who are effectually called and regenerated have a new heart and a new spirit created in them. 
are further sanctified really and personally through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection by his word and spirit dwelling in them. The dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed and the several lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified and they more and more become quickened and strengthened in all saving graces to the practice of true holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, brethren, this is not to suggest that our depraved nature with which we're born uh, is eradicated. Rather, it is the gift of a new principle of life in the midst of that totally depraved nature so that within every believer there are two natures, the old man of sin and the new man of righteousness, and the result is a lifelong internal struggle and conflict within every believer. Nevertheless, the prevailing principle, the prevailing principle of life for the believer is that new principle of life engendered by the indwelling of the Spirit of Christ. This spiritual bond between Paul and Jesus Christ was the motivating and guiding principle of his life. He was dead to the law as the ground or basis for his justification. He had been crucified with Christ. The spirit of Christ now lived within him. And as a result, he lived unto Christ. He lived out of Christ. And consequently, the life he now lived was not the life he had lived when he was a Pharisee. The life he now lived was not one that was driven by an attempt to merit with God, but his life now was one that was animated and directed by the Spirit of Christ. Brethren, that should also describe our lives. We should say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's, that's the testimony of every believer. And the question, of course, arises, brethren, is that true of us? Not only is that our testimony, but is it true? The life that I now live, I live by virtue of that living union and connection with Jesus Christ. Is it true that Jesus Christ is the guiding force of my life? Does he direct my life? Or am I still in that uh, place where, like Paul the Pharisee, I'm seeking to, as it were, justify myself by my works or by the keeping of the law or by other means, any other means other than Jesus Christ and the righteousness of Christ? The life of Christ within the believer can be seen. It comes to evidence in our daily walk and life. Now, true, brethren, we might hide that. We might hide our life uh, from the eyes of others, but you can't hide those things uh, from the Lord himself. The Lord knows whether it is that the Spirit of Christ is the animating force in your life. And for the child of God, it must be. Jesus Christ, brethren, lives in the heart of every believer. Notice how Paul concludes these, uh, or this uh, passage in uh, Galatians chapter 2. You recall that he's uh, addressing actually uh, the Apostle Peter and uh, Peter's failure. Uh, to uh, continue to eat with the Gentile Christians in Antioch in Syria. And through that action, Paul, or rather Peter, was actually really rebuilding again uh, the law 
was really saying implicitly to the Christians there in Antioch that it was necessary to keep the law in order to be uh, justified, to be declared righteous in the sight of God. But notice Paul's conclusion here in verse 21. He says, I do not frustrate uh, the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ, he says, is dead in vain. Paul here warns that to seek to be justified before God in any other way than through faith in Jesus Christ alone is to nullify the grace of God. And here Paul highlights what Peter had been doing by his conduct in Antioch, which amounted to a rebuilding again of the law as the basis for justification. And what Paul is saying here is that Peter, in doing what he was doing, was actually frustrating the grace of God. In effect, he was setting aside the grace of God. He was making the grace of God to be of no value and of no worth. The grace of God as revealed in the death of his son upon the cross, Peter by his actions and all those who seek uh, to uh, attain unto righteousness by virtue of the, their obedience to the law or by means of their own works, all such are actually uh, frustrating the grace of God. If it was true, says Paul, that righteousness came or could be attained by the law and Christ was dead in vain. If a man could be justified through the keeping of the law, if a man could be justified by his good works, if you and I can be justified, declared righteous in the sight of the God on the basis of our own work and worthiness, then he says here, there was no need. There was no need for Jesus Christ to have died. His incarnation was unnecessary. His taking upon himself the form of a man was unnecessary. His setting aside of his glory was unnecessary. His humiliation was of no value and of worth. His crucifixion also was unnecessary. His bearing of the wrath of God was to no end. God sending forth of his only begotten Son into this world was a failure, it was unnecessary. If a man could be justified through the keeping of the law, if a man could be justified by his own works and worthiness. The whole plan of salvation was based on a false premise. The false premise being that a man could only be justified by faith in Jesus Christ alone. If that were not true, if a man could be justified by the keeping of the law, if a man could be justified by his own works, and Jesus Christ had died in vain. His life and his death would have amounted to a complete futility. Paul here was saying to Peter, to Barnabas and to all the Jews in Antioch who had allowed themselves to be influenced by the Judaizers He's speaking here also to the Galatians, the churches of Galatia that had imbibed the teaching of the Judaizers. And he's speaking here to those in the church today who imagine that through the keeping of the law and through their obedience and through their good works that they can merit with God. He says to them, you're frustrating the grace of God. You're setting aside the grace of God. You're making the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross 
to be of no value and of no worth. The Judaizers, of course, uh, sought to do that when they sought to supplement uh, the saving work of Jesus Christ uh, by the merit of their own obedience to the law. Paul here says that is impossible. You can't add to the work of Jesus Christ. The work of Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary is all sufficient. It's the only basis. His righteousness is the only basis upon which a man may be justified in the sight of God. I'll just read to you a a very brief quote by the American Presbyterian uh, J. Gresham Mason concerning this passage. He says, "Uh, Christ will do everything or nothing. Earn your salvation uh, if your obedience to the law is perfect or else trust wholly to Christ's completed work. You cannot do both. You cannot combine merit and grace. If justification, even in slightest measure, is through human merit, then Christ died in vain. Brother, know this. Righteousness, your standing before God. Know this, your righteousness has not come by your obedience to the law. It does not come by virtue of your own good works. It does not come by virtue of your own worthiness. Rather, it comes by faith in Jesus Christ and his righteousness alone. Brethren, Jesus Christ did not die in vain. Jesus Christ died for those whom he loved and for those whom he purposed to save. Amen.